Hello and good afternoon friends, welcome to CEC live lecture. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on mechanism of sex determination. In our previous session also we discussed on the respective topic in detail. Continuing further from where we left, today also we would be discussing mechanisms of uh, sex determination in detail and for this discussion we have once again with us in our studios Dr. Eklavya Chauhan. Dr. Eklavya Chauhan is Associate Professor in Department of Botany, Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi. Dr. Chauhan has immense experience and he has contributed a lot in the area of academics. Dear friends, if you want to take advantages of Dr. Chauhan's immense experience, then you can talk to us. You can call us and ask questions from Dr. Chauhan and for contacting us, you need to note down our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is one 800 Dear friends, it's a toll-free number, so you can call us, but you are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture so that you get in-depth knowledge on today's topic and afterwards we promise to give answers to your questions through Dr. Iklavya Chauhan. So let's welcome our guest, Dr. Iklavya Chauhan, and let's try to grab maximum knowledge through him. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Uh, thank you, Geetika, for the kind words. And uh, hello, friends. Uh, if you remember, in our first lecture, we had discussed at great length uh, regarding the discovery of sex chromosomes, the definition of uh, sexual dimorphism, and a discussion on the Y chromosomes in human beings, its relationship to maleness, and also a discussion on the SRY gene along with how the X and the Y chromosomes could even exchange their genetic information, their genes at certain specialized zones called as the PAR or the pseudo autosomal regions. And therefore, uh, by that analogy, some of the traits could pass on from the X to the Y and vice versa. This was the basic information regarding the characteristics of Y chromosomes and the concept that we had crystallized in our minds was that perhaps it was the Y chromosome which was really important as far as the maleness was concerned. However, in today's lecture we would try to highlight that it may not be true universally. That means Y may not be responsible for maleness in all the other types of sex determination mechanisms that we are going to study uh, today. However, uh, coming again to the basic question as to what controls sex of an individual, the mechanisms were broadly classified into number one, genetically controlled mechanisms, which we are discussing at length at the moment. However, it may not be only the genes or the chromosomes. It could even be certain precise metabolic controls. And these particular metabolic controls could also contribute to the reversal of sex in certain organisms. And uh, they would also decide as to whether metabolic activity would lead to maleness or femaleness and so forth. There could be other mechanisms where the secretion of certain specific substances, mainly the hormones, would be the regulators and they would be the deciding factors whether the progeny would be a male or a female. And at the end, let us not forget the environment. The environmental factors would also be contributing the future sex of an individual in, in a very, very uh, interesting manner. Uh, when we talk about the genetically controlled sex determining mechanisms, then we have uh, the classifications of heterogamesis. It really means that whether the males have similar type of sex chromosomes or they have dissimilar type of sex chromosomes. So they are uh, type of 
differences between the x and the y and their number. It could also be in the form of a balance between the genes, maybe the between the x and the autosomes, because that's a very, very interesting aspect which we would study in case of Drosophila and, and later also in certain lower forms of organisms. There are other aspects also where a particular insect, if it is haploid or diploid, it would again be the deciding factor for the sex of an individual. And therefore, ploidy wise, they would be different. In fact, what different? They would be half uh, of the, uh, in terms of chromosome number of the other sex. And in certain cases, we are not talking of chromosomes at all. It's only certain single genes which are responsible for, uh, for the sex of uh, the future generation. If we were to then summarize the different chromosomal sex determination systems, we have systems which could be classified as XXXY. Why I chose the second one? Because that is supposed to be the most common one uh, and which we know for ourselves. That is all the placental mammals where the XX or the homogametic sex belongs to the female and XY belongs to the male and therefore a male has two types of gametes and hence uh, it would be called as heterogametic. Likewise, we have the XXXO system. Here again, the point to be noted is that the female is again homogametic because she has two X and the male has no Y but instead has XO. So that means only one of the chromosomes. Such type of uh, sex determination mechanism uh, would be studied in grasshoppers and other allied insects. A totally different type of uh, classification pattern is seen as ZZ. ZW. Why there is a need to change the terminology? Because here everything seems to be reversed. Because the male happens to be homogametic in this case and the female is heterogametic. In human beings, the male produces two types of sperms, one containing X and the other Y. Whereas in birds, snakes, butterflies, many of the amphibians, fishes, they would have the uh, heterogametic female. So that means it is here that the female is, uh, is getting two types of gametes. So in order to avoid the day-to-day -day confusion of X and Y, uh, the geneticists have tried to replace uh, the X and Y by Z and W respectively. And uh, what about the autosomes? We said in the introduction in our first lecture that the autosomes are related primarily to control the somatic characters. By somatic we mean the, the body characters but not the sex of an individual. But in case of certain insects, for example, we will see in Drosophila, it is the autosomes themselves which are interacting and trying to balance uh, with the X chromosomes in deciding as to what is going to be the final fate of the sex of an individual. So the different types of chromosomal sex determining mechanisms uh, would be, as I said, of XY, XX, XO, XX and then ZZ and ZW type. And of course, what we call as the haploid diploid system or the haplo diploid system which we would see in certain flies. So let us uh, dwell upon them in details. When we took the example of males on the last turn and we tried to signify its Y chromosome, we always were finding out the genes which were the holandric genes on the Y chromosome. So this is basically a part of the XXXY type where the female is double X and the male is XY. This is operative in humans, Drosophila and other insects and also angiosperms, the flowering plants like Melandrium, uh, the new name would be Silene and Humulus lupus that is hops and Coccinia. Now in this case, the type of gametes are are very common 
as we see in human beings. So, for example, uh, the male is 2n plus xy, that means 22 pairs of autosomes and 1xy, and the female is 2n plus xx, she is homogametic. She has only one type of gametes, that is n and x, and the male is heterogametic. So, as a result of fusion, we find that a female child would be got when the, when the X of the father and the N plus X of the mother fuses. And likewise, a son would be got when the Y of the father and the X of the mother would fuse. Uh, it's not very long time back that all in our, all our traditional knowledge and in our social customs, we used to really look down upon women who were bearing children of the female sex only and they were they were put to a lot of social stigma but now talking absolutely dispassionately from the genetical point of view uh, the female has nothing to do as far as to decide the sex of an individual because she is homogametic it is for the sperm whether it is the x or the y which is going to fuse with the ovum which always would remain x so one should ta change our ideas and be more scientific and uh, remove all the different times of blind faiths and bad practices. Uh, coming to the type of uh, the sperms and the, the ova is concerned, as I told you on the last lecture, that there are about 175 sperms of the Y type and likewise 175 million sperms of the X type. And both of them are competing with every ejaculation for, a, for fertilizing a single egg. So then you can see that the chances of getting a male and a female are exactly same. Theoretically, they are 50%. And therefore, uh, we, we follow all the types of the Mendelian uh, observations. Now we come to a little more important question. In human beings, we have been talking about Y and maleness. So that means the SRY region is controlling the testes development factor and it defines the maleness in an, in an organism. On the last turn, we also tried to do some jugglery with the chromosomes and said that perhaps XX could also be a male provided. In recombination, the SRY was shifted from the Y to the X chromosome. And likewise, a genetic constitution of an individual with XY could still be a female because the SRY had been removed from the Y chromosome. Is this idea universal? Perhaps not. We were restricting ourselves to a discussion of human beings. When it comes to Drosophila, a very interesting situation arises. Y chromosome is present. However, it does not define maleness. Now, that is a concept which is absolutely opposite to that found in the human beings. But at the same time, if it is not defining maleness, then what is the utility? In the future experiments, it was seen that... Although there is no role as far as the maleness is concerned, but then the expression of those male genes in terms of hormones and in terms of fertility of that male, that would reside with the genes of the Y chromosome. So, in other words, it would be required for male fertility and not for maleness as such. So, although we have the XXXY mechanism in Drosophila, the number of chromosomes in Drosophila are uh, 8, 2n is equal to 8, there are 3 pairs of autosomes and again the female is XX, the male is XY. Here the Y chromosome is, is uh, J-shaped and if you can see very clearly the differences in sizes of the male and the female. The female is much, much larger and her, uh, her body characters like bristles, the curvature of wings, the color of eyes, they are also different 
and this makes Drosophila a very, very interesting material uh, which was used by uh, the father of modern genetics, Professor Morgan, for his studies on Drosophila. However, a balanced theory was given by Professor C. B. Bridges and uh, this theory now signifies that there is a balance between the autosomes and the X chromosomes. This is the discovery which was made accidentally because Bridges observed that in spite of having the XXXY diploid individuals, there were other flies which had unusual or abnormal chromosomal constitutions. For example, there could be triploids, there could be tetraploids. Then how does one determine the sex in those type of uh, uh, situations? Because there, were, there are males, there are females, there are intersexes, super males or and super females which we in genetics we like to in genetical parlance we like to call them as meta females so it was found out that uh, if we look and redefine the genetic constitution of drosophila it would be three pairs of autosomes which means we can call them as 3a that means 1a would be equal to haploid set of chromosomes the value of autosomes set would be 1. In other words, the autosomes are going to define or determine maleness. Now, that is very unusual and dif uh, different from what we mentioned in case of human beings. And the X chromosomes would be responsible for femaleness. So, in effect, the X chromosome determines femaleness to the value of 1.5 that is 1.5 and the autosomes they determine maleness to the value of 1 and it is the ratio between the X chromosomes and the autosomal sets technically speaking as X by A and it would now depend on the value of X by A whether or what would be the sex of the future fruit fly. For example, if x by a is equal to 1, that means the number of x's and the number of autosomal sets is unity, then it is a female. If it is less than 1, but 0 0.5, greater than 0 0.5, then it is neither a male nor a female, it would be an intersex, of course, sterile. And the male would always be there only when x by a is either 0 0.5 or less than 0 0.5. So that means y chromosome deserves no mention in these calculations at all. And if y is present fine, then the organism if it is a male, it would be a fertile male and its absence even male could be there. So, that means it is basically the balance between the X and the autosomal sets. So, Bridges experiments were very classic and he took uh, advantage of uh, the recognition of triploids where he could find that this particular gene balance theory was showing XXX plus 2A. Now, here the uh, 3 by 2 that means this is 1.5 and even more than that. In that case, so that means if it is more than 1 this ratio, then it becomes a meta female or a super female. So, likewise, we have all different types of permutations in the form of super males, diploid males, triploid intersexes and so forth, thereby indicating that there is a balance between the X chromosomes and the autosomal sets. In other words, we can have the range from a male to a meta female. If one really looks carefully at the constitution of XO, XO plus AA, 
the ratio of x by a is still 0 0.5 and it is male. Now, how do we distinguish it from the one which is above this, which is x, y and a, a? Here also the ratio is 0 0.5. Having identical x by a ratios are going to make the fruit fly as male. But then, where y is not present, that particular male is not going to be fertile and would not perpetuate the next generation. So, that means it again gives us an idea and a proof that y is not determining maleness, y is only determining the fertility of that male and basically it is the, it is the ratio between the x and a, a means the sets which is going to decide the future phenotypes of the individuals. So, it, not, it is not necessary that the triploid in this case would always be um, uh, a, a uh, intersex. It could be a tetraploid also. Only the chromosomal sets need to be complete. So, to summarize, it is a beautiful balance between the X and the A chromosomes. If you observe that the, uh, that the X becomes heavier, then the sex tilts towards the female. And the heavier it is, more and more superlative females are got, which means they are more robust in size and uh, they are more aggressive and uh, they are also gigantic. This in genetics is also called as gigantism. And if the balance is outweighed by the autosomes. So, more of the autosomes would mean naturally that the number of X would be less and now the organism would go more towards maleness. So, this is the basic uh, genic balance as we find in case of Drosophila. So, in spite of being or sharing a common sex determining mechanism of XXXY, uh, there are so many variations in Drosophila. Another very important uh, variation if we see as a corollary of uh, the X, 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 Y and X, X and X, O in Drosophila gives us what is called as gynandromorphs. Gynandromorphs would mean that it is half female and half male. In other words, half of the body would have the male characters and the other half would have female. Actually, what has happened? The cell division has been faulty and one of the X chromosomes is lost. At the time of spindle formation, the chromosomal movement was not proper and it got dislodged from the microtubules or the spindle fibers and when it, it, it lost its way, it degenerated and it did not reach the poles and cytokinesis occurred. So, that means one of the cells would have, one of the daughter cells would have one X chromosome less and that particular daughter cell becomes a male whereas its sister cell still remains a female and then further mitotic divisions would give rise to uh, the male and the female cells respectively. If half of that fly becomes male and the other half as female, it would be called as a bilateral gynandromorph because the two sides of a fly would have different sexes. Uh, one could see that uh, one of the wings is a smaller one because it is that of a, of a uh, male and the uh, female part which is the, the uh, left part becomes much larger. Even the color of the eyes, the nature of the bristles, the curvature of the wings, everything seems to be different and this is just because that there has been a misdivision. By misdivision we mean that one of the X chromosomes is lost during the, the poleward, poleward movement of the chromosomes and as a result, uh, we have a fly which is half male and half female. An even more interesting aspect of this could be that if there are random uh, misdivisions in the body of the zygote, then it would lead to say a mosaic of a fly where some of the cells 
or, or body cells of that fly would be male the other cells would be uh, would be female so this is called as a sex mosaic or a piebald mosaic it is rare but there in drosophila genetics uh, let us also now uh, make mention of uh, the nature of sexuality in one of a very very primitive uh, nematode this nematode is called as ceno rhabditis elegans this is one of the very popular organisms which is used in the genetical studies it has so many advantages number 1 it is very primitive type of nematode much more important than that is that the adult has just 959 somatic cells so you one can imagine how small the whole uh, insect body or the organism body would be if there are so less number of cells don't you think it's so easy to find out the precise lineage of the embryonic origins of each of these cells and we can trace the uh, the the phylogeny uh, very very precisely so this makes the organism a, a very uh, interesting genetical object with reference to sex determination the two types of phenotypes are observed in uh, this type of worm one is a male the male has testes only and the other is hermaphrodite which means it has two gonads in the larvae they could produce both sperms as well as eggs in other words there is absolutely no no organism of uh, this nematode which is purely female either it is hermaphrodite or bisexual or male and then the eggs in this nematode are fertilized by self fertilization so when self fertilization occurs then of course one of the gametes uh, from the from the male is going to uh, fuse with the egg and finally make a hermaphrodite so that means 99% of the progeny are hermaphrodites and just over 1% are females and then they follow the 50 is to 50% pattern so what do we conclude we conclude that genes they are located on both the x chromosomes and they are going to determine the maleness if there are two x chromosomes then it would be a hermaphrodite and males would have just one x chromosome and what we want to signify here is that an organism can be a male even in the absence of a y chromosome and therefore the autosomes also have a very important role to determine the sexuality in other words the balance of the autosomes and the x chromosomes is operative here also we are not changing the terminology because it would create a lot of confusion therefore we always highlight the differences in the next part of our discussion we, are, we will also see some other interesting uh, sex determining mechanisms
uh, the variation of the homogametic females is also exemplified in the form of XX and XO type of sex determination. As we find, the XX is a female and XO, by O we mean that there is no chromosome, that means only one chromosome is there along with the autosomes. This type of sex determination is operative in true bugs, that is Hemiptera, Orthoptera, which is the grasshoppers and roaches, and in case of plants, the aquatic velisneria and the medicinal plant Dioscoria. Here, therefore, we would find that if there are two X chromosomes, we are talking in terms of a female. And if there is just one X chromosome, then the organism is a male, which means the pairing of X chromosomes determines feminism and the unpaired X chromosome determines the masculine sex. Now, this male would have two types of sperms. It would have autosomes plus X and autosomes plus nothing. So, this is a very interesting situation where one organism has two sperms of different chromosome numbers and the one which fuses would later determine as to what is going to be the future sex of the individual. For example, if there is 2n plus xo and it is a, it is a male, in the first instance it has one chromosome number less. The female has one chromosome number, one chromosome more because it has two x's and the female is homogametic. So, the type of gametes are n plus x and n plus x. The male has two types of sperms and depending upon the fertilization, the male and the females are got whether they will be 2n plus double x or they would be 2n plus xo. This again signifies the fact that sex determination has developed in evolution even without the participation of a Y chromosome, which raises many questions about the antiquity of the Y chromosome. Did it come later? It must have come later because we find that all these primitive uh, organisms are having a well-defined sex determination even without the absence of Y. Coming to another situation, we have heterogametic females. We have never heard of heterogametic females in uh, human beings. The male would have two homomorphic X chromosomes. So, that means a male can give rise to sperms only of one type and the female would be heterogametic. Either it would be X and Y or it would be X and O. O means nothing. So, that means both these situations are possible. The male would be now homogametic. This raises a lot of confusion in our minds because we are used to X and Y. So, in order to avoid this confusion, the geneticists have replaced X by Z and Y by W respectively. And therefore, the new type of sex determining mechanism now becomes ZWZZ, which means the, the male would be ZZ and homogametic or it would be ZO and ZZ. So, in this case, the ZW and ZO signify the heterogametic females. Uh, this type of uh, mechanism is very common in certain insects, for example, in gypsy moths. Uh, surprisingly, birds, that is the aves, reptiles and fishes, which are true vertebrates, they also exhibit this type of ZW, uh, ZZ type, which is totally reversed of our popular XX and XY mechanism. Even plants like Figaria uh, would also exhibit uh, ZW type. You would find that uh, the, the, the male would be... Uh, homogametic and the female 
would be heterogametic and one of the chromosome therefore would be smaller that is the W1 and uh, the sex of the individual would depend on whether the progeny is homogametic or heterogametic. If it is heterogametic then it is a, it's a male and if it is a heterogametic it is a female. So, this type of uh, sex determination is exactly opposite to what we have been studying so far. The moths and the butterflies, they have again the ZZZW type, but then of a little varied nature. We call them as ZOZZ type. Here also the moths and uh, butterflies, the female would have a single Z chromosome. So, the other one will not be there and therefore, a female will have one chromosome less and hence it would be heterogametic. This female will also be producing two types of, uh, of X, one containing the autosomes plus Z and one containing only the autosomes. So, that means 50 percent of the X are with Z and the remaining 50 percent without it. The male would be again as usual homogametic and uh, would produce only a single type of sperms with Z and therefore, it would be the kind of egg which is being fertilized would decide the fate of the individual. And of course, the male and the female as I have been telling for, for the last two type of examples would have different chromosome numbers. Still another uh, very interesting uh, type of sex determining mechanism is seen in bees, honey bees, ants, sawflies and wasps. Now, these particular insects have not even not just one or two chromosomes different in the male and the female. The difference is of an entire genomic number or the entire haploid set. For example, the males in these examples which I have just mentioned are haploid and the females are diploid. So, that means the females would have double the number of chromosomes. If the eggs are fertilized, they would naturally become diploid and when they are diploid, they would metamorphose into females. If the eggs remain unfertilized, they will still develop, they will still metamorphose, but the direction of their metamorphosis will be such that they would give rise to males. Now, that is very interesting. This is formation of an individual without fertilization. This would be a case of parthenogenesis. We call this as erinotocus parthenogenesis. So, that means in case of uh, bees and ants, erinotocus parthenogenesis is both a means of reproduction as well as a means of sex determination. Meiosis obviously would be normal in case of females because they are 2N. However, there will be absolutely no meiosis in case of males because they are haploid and we, we do not know of of haploid meiosis. So, that means during spermatogenesis, there is no reduction, there is no crossing over. So, this is how the haploidy, haplodiploidy mechanism operates. So, in the VASP, we find, for example, if the metaphase shows 20 chromosomes in the diploid, the number of chromosomes in a male would be just half and there would be 10. So, that means it would depend whether this particular egg is going to be fertilized or not. If it is fertilized, then it yields a female and if it is not, then again it is a male. And honey bees show a very interesting example. The honey bee has a, a lot of social structure and differentiation and different types of, of uh, the workers there. Honeybee queen whose main job is reproduction 
is deployed. She is fertile and the 2n is 32, that is the, the somatic number is 32. This queen is going to lay down two types of eggs. That is also very interesting because she controls the receptacle where the sperms are going to be received. Either she receives them or she doesn't. If she receives them, then the eggs, they get fertilized and they give rise to a diploid zygote. A diploid zygote with 2n of 32 would give rise to a female. And if the eggs remain unfertilized, then still a haploid zygote is formed. Technically, we should not call it as a zygote because zygote is a fertilization uh, product. But then a haploid structure is got, which has a haploid chromosome number n is equal to 16. And this would metamorphose into a male. This would be what is called as a sterile worker. A sterile worker. And the queens would be got depending upon what is the type of diet that they are consuming during their development. So here comes another very interesting aspect of diet, of nutrition, of the rate of metabolism. We can dwell upon this fact a little later. And that is metabolism also has a very very important role to play in directing the sex of an individual, maybe to a certain extent. So we say that metabolism may be vital. In some cases, we are a little sure that they are. For example, there was a scientist by the name Crew. He was of the opinion that sex is basically an equitable division between the anabolic and the catabolic systems. And it would be the balance of this two components of metabolism which would direct the course of what the future sex of an individual would take shape. Likewise, uh, two scientists, Shull and Whitney, they gave some very interesting facts. They observed that in rotifers, if the metabolic rate increases of an individual, this automatically increases the maleness. So, in other words, in rotifers, the maleness uh, is directly proportional to the rate of metabolism, which may not be true in other organisms. The scientist by the name Riddle also understood the importance of metabolism, especially in case of pigeons and doves. And he said that if there is an increase in metabolism, there would be more of maleness. Perhaps what he meant was that due to increase in metabolism, uh, certain male producing hormones uh, would be more, whereas on the contrary, femaleness would be observed if there is a decrease in metabolism. So that means these are very um, oblique references of sex determination uh, by means of uh, metabolic products. However, the role of hormones is much more important, much more serious and well documented in literature. And the classical example we find is of a marine echiuroid worm uh, by the name Bonellia viridis. It's a very interesting aspect. Right from the beginning, the phenomenon of sexual dimorphism is seen, which is even better as we had talked about uh, much better than even Drosophila. In Drosophila, there was no doubt a difference in the size of the male and the female, the latter being larger. But here the adult female is about an inch, which means about 2.53 centimeters and has a very, very complex anatomical organization. On the other hand, the male is very small. So small that it is almost of the size of a protozoan and has rudimentary organs. So that means the internal differentiation is very poor. 
and it doesn't have its complete metabolism. So, the male Bonilia lives as a parasite in the uterus of the female. So, all the larvae to begin with are going to be genetically and cytologically similar. What decides the course of their sex in the future uh, time to come? It would depend where this larva is going to settle. For example, if the larva settles on the proboscis, that is the mouth parts of the adult female, then it is sure to develop into a male. And if by chance the larva doesn't find the, the female uh, to hang on to and develops therefore in isolation, that is in water, it is bound to develop or metamorphose later into a female. That means the proboscis of the female has something to do with the deciding the sex. So, if the incompletely developed male is even detached from the proboscis, it would not, not develop into a female because it came once, it had a contact with the proboscis, it took some chemicals. After its detachment, surprisingly, it is going to develop into an intersex. In other words, in terms of sex determination, now it is confused. This proves that the proboscis of the female secretes a hormone-like substance which is going to suppress femaleness and it would initiate maleness in the attached larvae. No such inhibition is there if the larvae are going to develop in isolation and therefore the femaleness would now dominate. So, this is how we signify an uh, about the differences of sizes of uh, Bonellia viridis and uh, its future course of metamorphosis depending upon the hormonal control. The hormones uh, also play a very important role in uh, the sex determination in case of uh, birds. The uh, famous example is Crew's hen. Uh, uh, which has been uh, named in order of the, of the geneticist crew. In some of the birds, we find that there is only one gonad in the female. The female is supposed to have two gonads, but then she has only one gonad. And this develops into an ovary. So, if by chance the functional ovary is destroyed, then the other gonad which was still now rudimentary would give rise to or would develop into testes. In the presence of the functional gonad, it was not doing anything. It was being suppressed. So, this signifies that the female sex can be reversed into a male sex. So, that means this particular male sex would now be fertile, the, the future generation of chicks would now have a segregation ratio of 2 is to 1, that is 2 is to 1 females and 1 of the males would again signify that the female is heterogametic and also enjoys what we call as ZW uh, type of sex determination. Removal of the ovary actually means that the adrenals become active and help in the development of testes. Now, this aspect of reversal of, text, of sex is very important, uh, which uh, signifies that uh, the, the question of sex in some of the organisms is still an open question. And depending upon the, pre, uh, the, the, the predominance of a particular hormone, uh, we would find uh, that the sex takes a shape. The most classical example which we even see on the roads as far as the hormonal control of sex determination is what is called as free martin. We see so many cows on the road, uh, the females, they look females uh, apparently, but then they are sterile. Now, how is it that we have so many sterile uh, female cows uh, on the streets? Actually, if 
in cattle if twins of two sexes are occurring that means there are two fetuses at the same time one male and the female it is found usually that the female member which is born is usually a sterile intersex and this intersex is called as a free martin what really happened which made one of the members of the twin as sterile intersex and the other was a perfect male so that means this particular intersex would have external female genitalia would be normal and internal sex organs would be missing and uh, male twin is normal now this is not a case of male chauvinism it is all a hormonal story actually what happens is that there is a fusion of the fetal membranes of these twin calves and therefore at one point or the other there has to be a common blood circulation the male hormones in the fetus are synthesized earlier so what happens is that these particular male hormones have a common blood stream they also pass to the blood stream of the female fetus there they suppress the differentiation of the female internal sex organs so the internal sex organs are not there only the female genitalia develop so this type of the female calf which is born along with the uh, with the male brother twin is usually a sterile intersex and is called as free martin so this aspect also uh, signifies the importance of hormones in sex determination lastly the environment cannot be divorced as far as the expression of genes is concerned because in our uh, any treatise we always say that the gene expression is also genes and the environment this is the final expression of a gene so uh, some very interesting aspects as far as environment is concerned are seen in uh, turtles we find that the turtles are are sitting or brooding on their eggs even if they are not in a cluster of eggs which are buried in the in in the soil or in mud near water there has to be a difference in temperature of the ones which are at the periphery and the ones which are buried deeper so it has been found that if these particular eggs are exposed to a higher temperature that is around 30 to 35 degrees celsius they would develop only into females and if the temperature is low then their future course of sex determination is males now this is very interesting we can we can perform experiments artificially by exposing these eggs to uh, in an incubator at different temperatures and we can change their sexes so that means the question of sex was an open question and uh, took a future course depending upon what the temperature was interestingly crocodiles alligators and and many lizards would have a situation which is absolutely reverse of turtles so that in that case even snakes low temperature would mean females and high temperature would mean uh, the uh, males size of an organism also in certain cases may be the deciding factor for the sex of an individual it has been found that in a marine annelid or fire trucha young animal produces sperms and it is a male whereas the same organism when it becomes older it changes its mind its physiology and now starts laying eggs and therefore within the course of a single lifetime or life cycle of an organism you can see a change in sex from male to female and if you amputate the older parts of this particular female then you would find that it again starts behaving like a male and starts producing uh, sperms so that means there is some connection between the age of this organism and 
its uh, sex. Size of the egg also could be a deciding factor in many marine primitive archaea annelids. If the small eggs are there, they are laid, they would turn into males. And if there are large eggs, large to the extent of being say even 27 times larger, then they would metamorphose and develop into females. So likewise, age also is uh, considered to be a criteria uh, of a very primitive type of uh, uh, sexual differentiation in mollusks and the young mollusks would be functional males, the mature mollusks would be females. The entire discussion brings us to a point that in some of the primitive organisms, the genes for maleness and femaleness are going to be activated at different time periods of the life cycle within the time, uh, time span or lifespan of the same individual. There are many instances where the chromosomes have no role to play and it is only a single gene which is important as far as the control of sex is concerned. There are many green algae like Chlamydomonas, fungi like Neurospora and yeast and higher plants like maize, asparagus where only a single gene is responsible for determination of sex. Now this type of sex determining mechanism would be uh, exemplified by monogenic type of inheritance. Uh, we would dwell upon the sex determination in plants uh, in a separate lecture where a very detailed discourse uh, should be expected because we have a whole variety of papayas, of cannabis which can change their sex simply by spraying them with a hormone. So we have to see how close we are with the genes and the environment and the nutrition. Thank you. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us a productive session. And friends, if you want to give your feedback for this particular lecture, then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. We are going to upload this lecture on YouTube. And afterwards, if you feel that you have any question which you are required to be answered, then do write to us. So we will try to give answers to your questions when next time Dr. Iklavya Chauhan visits our studio. So we would be meeting again very soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you.